Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar today. My name is Sasha Preston Suni, and I work with Chug LLP in our Los Angeles office. Today, our panel of legal professionals will be sharing insight into the immigration policy changes under the Biden administration. There is some exciting news for individuals as well as businesses that sponsor foreign workers. If at any time during the presentation today you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A chat box. At the end of our presentation today, we will have some time to answer some of your questions. We've got a great panel of immigration experts today to share their knowledge, including Kirti Kalra, partner and attorney in our Santa Clara, California office, Deepika Singh, immigration lead based in Santa Clara, California, and Kevin Tung, attorney in our Los Angeles, California office. So let's get started. Deepika, the H-1B cap season has begun for fiscal year 2022. Is there anything new for employers to keep in mind this time around? Thank you, Sasha. A very warm welcome to all our audience. Uh, well, yes, the cap season is almost hitting for this year and uh, the registration was implemented last year, which was very successfully done. While the process remains the same, the only change which have has happened this year is the registration or the enrollment dates. USCIS has changed the dates from March 1st to March 9th. So for the fiscal year 2022 registration process, USCIS will open enrollments or the registrations on March 9th, starting 12 p.m. EST, which is 9 a.m. PST. Employers and reps can continue to register until March 25th, 2021. The enrollment will stop at 12 p.m. EST on March 25th, which is again 9 a.m. PST. Therefore, we want to make sure that all enrollments and registrations are done in a timely manner. The process remains fairly the same. Petitioners or the reps will have to create an account on my USCIS online as a registrant. Um, although petitioners may be able to register for an account sooner, they will not be able to submit any registrations until noon of March 9th. The fee will remain the same. It, there is a $10 registration fee which has to be paid upon, you know, when finalizing the registration and while checking out. The USCIS system did accept credit card payments last year and we are hoping that that will remain the same this year as well. After the registration is done, uh, USCIS will continue to take registra registrations until March 25th. Uh, then once they've received enough numbers, they will do a lottery, which probably may happen by March 31st of 2021. Uh, anybody who's selected in the lottery where the the portal will show up as a selected uh, or a nominee and USCIS will also issue a receipt of acceptance. That receipt will be required uh, to be, you know, to be included in the petition filing when USCI, when the petitioner or the attorney files the application. Uh, the wage level based H1B visas, which was supposed to be implemented this year or which was supposed to go in effect on March 9th has been postponed. Uh, USCIS has pushed it until December 31st of 2021, uh, so we don't have to really worry about it um, and that will probably get implemented for next year's quota. Once cases are selected, um, USCIS will have to, you know, you, they, they've given a time frame to file the applications. Last year we had about 90 days to file one petition by June 30th. Hopefully this year also it will be the same time frame. Anybody who's CAP subject, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're filing your applications on time because if you are OPT or your STEM OPT is expiring or exhausting, you want to have make sure that your application is filed in a timely manner so that you can avail your CAP CAP. Um, we would request all petitioners to talk to immigration practitioners to understand the process better uh, and, uh, you know, ha ha do successful implementations. Thanks. Thank you, Deepika. So the Biden administration also put certain immigration policies on hold from the prior administration. Um, Deepika, could you tell us a little bit more about that? So yeah, um, so the ban on the non-immigrant visas, which include the H and L and the J's are still not, it's still not revoked. They continue to be there and until March 31st, the ban is still still there on the H and LJ visas. Uh, while US consulates have opened up and they are taking some visa stamping uh, you know cases but we do see that there are a lot of 221 g's and 221 f's which are being issued unless there's there's really an exemption to the ban 
uh, Joe Biden, the President Joe Biden released an executive order on February 2nd instructing federal immigration agencies to conduct comprehensive re reviews of their immigration policies, which were formed or were being formed under the Trump administration. This also included the public charge rule. Um, agencies are instructed to recommend policy revisions. DHS and DOS have been asked to report within 60 days, which is around April 3rd, 2021, on how the public charge rule impacts the promotion of legal immigration and public health. So they must also make recommendations on the policy revisions and you know, provide appropriate um, exclusions. Um, the review and amendment of the US immigration regulations and policies to promote inclusion, integration and citizenship for immigrants. Uh, this would also help restoring faith in our legal immigration system and strengthen the integration and inclusion efforts for new Americans. Um, so Department of Homeland Security rule would limit the ability of legal immigrants to adjust or extend their immigration status or gain full citizenship based on their receipt of public benefits such as Medicaid. The executive order also resents a memorandum requiring family sponsors to repay the government if relatives receive public benefits. So a lot of uh, policies ha are under reconsideration. So we will be hearing back on those updates very soon. Thanks for that overview, Deepika. Um, so what changes has the Biden administration made to deportation policy? Right, so there have been changes to the deportation policies and the notices to appear. Uh, they've frozen previous deportation policies and are putting a pause on most removals for 100 days. The Biden administration has overturned policies that broadens the authority of government agents to find and deport unauthorized immigrants without prioritization. DHS has also decided that certain deportations are on hold until 100 days and they will implement interim civil enforcement policies. Uh, the Biden administration will also return to the Obama era policy, which prioritized removing undocumented immigrants who were convicted of serious crimes, those who were posed a, those who posed a threat to national security and unauthorized border crossers. One of the main being they canceled the 2017 notice to appear policy, which expanded the scope of in which the foreign nationals were placed in removal proceedings. Now, what exactly is an NTA? An NTA was basically a notice to appear, which was a formal charging document issued by the DHS, which places a foreign national in removal proceedings. So under the 2017 policy, USCIS could issue an NTA to any foreign national whose application for immigration benefits were denied if they lacked lawful status at a time of denial. So once issued, recipients of an NTA would have to appear in front of an immigration judge who would decide whether the charged foreign national will be removed from the United States or would be allowed to stay if eligible for some other form of uh, relief. So failure to appear, appear in the immigration court would have resulted in absentism and such removal would have put a bar on re-entry into the US for five years. So the Biden administration reverts to the Obama era policy under NTA and has asked them to issue these NTAs with more limited circumstances, So, which is actually a good news. Thanks for that, Deepika. Now there's some incredibly exciting news related to US citizenship. Kevin, could you tell us a little bit more about some of the policy that's in the works on this front? Hi, Sasha. Yes, so the eight-year pathway policy comes from the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, which is a bill that uh, President Biden introduced um, on his first day in office. And uh, the bill would provide a road to legalization for foreign nationals who lack lawful status. Um, the first thing to note is that the applicants for the eight-year pathway, uh, they must be physically present in the U.S. on or before January 1st, 2021, okay? But essentially, the eight-year pathway policy, we, we can break this down into two phases. The first phase allows the applicants who qualify um, to apply for temporary legal status. Okay, after five years, if they pass security background checks, pay their taxes and meet other criteria, um, they can then apply for a green card. Um, and after they hold their green cards for another uh, three years and provided that they pass additional background checks and demonstrate knowledge of English and uh, US civics, um, these green card holders can then apply to become US citizens. So. The first phase is five years, 
And um, so the, 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 five, the five years from the first phase on temporary legal status plus the three years from the second phase as green card holders uh, make up the total eight year pathway to citizenship. Um, now, it's important to also note that uh, there are three particular groups of individuals um, that can bypass the first phase. And they and these groups are well, the first group is DACA dreamers. Second is uh, TPS holders. So individuals on temporary protected status. And the third group is uh, individuals, so immigrant farm workers who meet specific requirements. These three groups of individuals can skip the first phase um, and apply uh, for green cards immediately. Um, and in total, there are about uh, 11 million people that will qualify for um, the eight year pathway uh, policy. So. Um, of course, this policy is, is certainly quite ambitious, and we, we just want to emphasize that thus far, um, all of this information is still under review. There is no actual text of the bill yet, so it's, it's, it's unclear uh, how these proposals would play out and which policies would generate uh, congressional, congressional support. Well, that is certainly some exciting news, and we look forward to seeing what's on the horizon with that, Kevin. Thanks for that overview. Um, so President Biden is also hoping to make the process of naturalization easier. What does that plan include, Kevin? So first of all, naturalization is the process uh, by which the U.S. citizenship uh, is granted to lawful permanent resident after meeting certain uh, requirements. Now, on February 2nd, 2021, President Biden released uh, an executive order. Um, and one of the sections of this executive order talks about promoting naturalization, um, specifically it provides that the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, and the Secretary of Homeland Security, um, they will have 60 days from the date of the executive order, which means by April 3rd, 2021, uh, to have developed plans describing any agency actions that they will take to improve the naturalization process. So specifically, this this, this is a very comprehensive review of the entire uh, naturalization um, process from start to finish. And it, it includes reviewing the entire na uh, N-400 application, uh, reviewing the fingerprinting process, reviewing the background and security checks, uh, reviewing the, natural, the actual naturalization interview, um, going over the naturalization test, which uh, consists of two components, the civics uh, component, component and the English language component. And last but not least, the administration of the oath of allegiance. So, Really, again, from 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 start to finish, the entire naturalization process will be taken apart, will be reviewed, and the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, and the Secretary of Homeland Security will need to um, come up with a plan to describe any actions that they will take um, to further facilitate and promote the naturalization process. Um, so, it's it's a very it's, it's a very important piece, and and again, it adds to the holistic and comprehensive approach that this uh, bill President Biden has introduced. Um, you know, on his first day of, of, of office, um, really signifies the, the type of approach and active um, role that President Biden envisions he takes throughout his uh, presidency. Um, you know, sets the tone, it really sets the tone for how, how, um, how he, he would like to shape the U.S. immigration uh, system as a whole. Well, that's certainly some heartening news. Thanks for that overview, Kevin. So the Biden administration also wants to increase the number of green cards and work visas available. Could you explain how that would work, Kevin? Sure. So uh, we want to, so we want to look at it uh, from both the employment-based green card and the the family-based green card points of view. Uh, for both of these, the bill aims to clear backlogs, uh, recapture unused visas from prior years, and reduce lengthy wait times. So these are, among others, the three primary uh, goals that the bill aims to achieve. Um, but there is a slight difference between the two, between the family-based green card and the employment-based green card. And that is that the bill uh, increases the per-country visa caps for family-based green cards. Um, and for employment-based green cards, uh, the bill eliminates the per-country visa caps. Um, another point to point out is that the bill makes it easier for uh, graduates of U.S. universities with advanced uh, STEM degrees uh, to stay in the U.S. The bill really just says that, you know, that the process will become easier. Uh, but again, no details have been released yet. Uh, but it, it does goes to show uh, just how much of an emphasis that the, that the, uh, president, the Biden presidency is putting towards retaining um, these elite tech uh, elite um, scholars or researchers or scientists in, in the tech field um, to help grow the economy, uh, U.S. economy further. Now, 
What's also important to note is that um, the bill will also provide work authorization to the dependents of the H-1B visa holders. So again, it, 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 the entirety of the bill, uh, specifically here talking about um, the how these U.S. graduates with uh, doctoral or advanced STEM degrees will be able to, will be able to uh, um, a more easier stay in the U.S., um, the whole approach modernizes the immigration system, right, and, prior, and really shows that it prioritizes to, to keep families together and, and help grow the overall U.S. economy. Now, Pre President Biden has also previously mentioned that his, pro that his proposal uh, would not count the spouse and children of green card holders toward the annual quotas. So even though this is not included in the bill so far, it may be included uh, in the future um, again. This bill is very comprehensive. It's a very comprehensive overhaul of the U.S. immigration system. So we can foresee that the bill will likely undergo a long battle in Congress. Um, but it does, again, really help set the tone for how President Biden plans to realize uh, his vision for U.S. immigration policy. Well, those are definitely some exciting proposals if they do end up making it into U.S. policy. Biden has already taken action to strengthen DACA. In other news, uh, Kirti, could you let us know what exactly is DACA and how does Biden plan to improve the program? Well, hi, everyone. Th um, thanks for joining us today. Well, I, I think, you know, piggybacking on what um, Kevin said earlier, uh, they're trying to take a holistic approach to reforming immigration to conform to the standard that we had set out with the Obama administration, and it's, it's essentially continuing and adding on to it to taking it to the next step. So DACA was one of the initiatives that was started by the Obama administration, to, um, which provides uh, deportation deferral and work authorization for individuals who arrived in the United States as children without lawful or immigration status. Um, <clears throat> You know, and in, in order to be eligible, Sasha, was that you had to uh, be under the age of 31 at the uh, as of June 15, 2012. You had to have entered the United States before your 16th birthday and continuously resided um, from June 15, 2007 to now, at, around the time when they implemented DACA. Um, and um, you would have to... Um, uh, well, and when you apply, you had to be present in the country at the time of making the request for DACA. Um, and all, on top of that, there were other minor uh, uh, requirements added, which was, you know, you did not have any lawful status in the United States on June 15, 2012. You were currently enrolled in school, obtaining a GED, um, or, you know, being honorably discharged veteran of U.S. Armed Forces or the Coast Guard. And lastly, you had you had to make sure you were not convicted for a felony or a significant misdemeanor uh, that does not otherwise pose a threat to uh, security and public safety. And so the with the addition of reviving this uh, DACA program, the Biden administration is, as I mentioned before, trying to take it one step further, which is to help create a path, eventually solve the DACA, solve the DACA issue, which is to help create a path towards citizen, permanent residency and then citizenship. Um, what that will include specifically is still up to debate and is still being worked out. But as soon as more details are available, we will obviously share it here. Thank you, Kirti. In other exciting news, President Biden has ended the travel ban for nationals of certain countries. Um, Kirti, what is the DOS doing to help address the ban's impact? All right. So, um, you know, uh, as, as everybody knows, er, er, during the Trump administration, they had uh, banned blocking nationals from 13 countries, mainly African and or Muslim majority countries from entering into the United States. Um, the ban was immediately lifted, I, I believe, on the first, if not the second day of the Biden administration. Um, and, you know, while there may be other restrictions, such as, you know, people get trying to get a visa on H&L to enter the country, uh, this particular ban was lifted uh, because um, because of the rhetoric with uh, against the particular ban. And and in order to start the healing process, the repairing um our national relations process with other countries, uh, Biden 
uh, President Biden has also directed the State Department to process visas for individuals affected from that country, from those countries, and develop plans to address the harm that may have caused them in the long term for the individuals and the and the people, uh, the country, and its the relationship with that country in itself. Great, thank you. What changes is Biden planning to enact when it comes to the United States' refugee and asylum policies? Well, yes, you know, just adding on to the uh, holistic approach of reforming immigration, um, you know, they are uh, one of the one of the things that Joe Biden aims to address is the root cause of migration of Central America to the United States. Uh, his administration will seek to make the refugee and asylum process more more orderly and humane. But obviously, we all know that it's going to take time for these processes to be put in place, as this is a, a large overhaul. So the new program uh, would establish a refugee processing centers abroad with to increase the time for vetting and better identifying ca- candidates for refugee status. And then... You know, and, and I, as a sign of goodwill and a sign of good immigration policy, they will also terminate, immediately terminate the continuation of um, building that U.S.-Mexico border wall. And the government officials will then use those funds either to uh, facilitate the immigration policies that Biden administration has in mind or for other purposes um, that are necessary. Thanks for that. Overview, Kirti. So there certainly seem to be some exciting immigration policies on the horizon under the Biden administration. That brings us to the end of our presentation um, portion of the event today, but we still have time for question and answer session. If you haven't already, please enter your questions into the chat box and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for today. It looks like we have a question for Deepika here. Deepika, can an applicant for an H-1B register through two different employers? Uh, so, Sasha, to the answer, the answer to that question is yes, you could. Uh, and a particular beneficiary can do a registration through two different employers, which do not have the same job offer. So, if there are two companies that are giving up a separate job profile or a separate job offer, then yes, registrations can be done through two different employers. Wonderful. Thank you, Deepika. This next question is for Kevin. Kevin, are there changes to the naturalization test under President Biden's recent proposal? Hi, Sasha. So the executive order uh, issued on February 2nd, 2021 that I discussed earlier uh, does not specify whether there will be changes to the naturalization test. As of now, the naturalization test still consists of two portions, the English language portion and the civics portion. Um, USCIS has recently revised on the civics portion of the naturalization test, and specifically uh, the applicants with a filing date on or after December 1st, 2020, are required to take the 2020 version of the civics test. And those with filing dates uh, before December 1st, 2020, are required to take the 2008 version of the civics test. Uh, There there are indeed a number of differences between the two versions. Uh, For example, the 2008 version will ask you uh, up to 10 questions from a list uh, from a list of 100 and you have to answer six questions correctly in order to pass and for the 2020 version you will be asked uh, 20 questions from a list of 128 questions and you have to answer 12, 12 questions correctly to pass um, like i said there are other differences um, but uh, but but something to point out is that the english language portion uh, which includes the reading the writing and the speaking components uh, the english language portion uh, does not change um, so that's something to watch out for but no to answer the question the executive order uh, does not specify whether there will be changes to the present uh, naturalization test format okay thank you for that kevin This next question is for Kirti. Kirti, what are the things that USCIS considers when they are renewing DACA applications? Right. So the things that, so if you've uh, obtained your DACA and now you're filing for renewal, one of the the things that they consider is that the person did not depart the United States on or after August 15, 2012 without advanced parole. Now, if you traveled with advanced parole, then that's fine. Um, 
and then the person has continuously resided in the United States states since he or she uh, most recent request for DACA was approved up to the present time. And lastly, again, uh, when the person has not been considered uh, convicted of a felony or a significant misdemeanor or three or more misdemeanor that did not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety. Thank you, Kirti. This next question is for Deepika. I have a master's from India. Do I qualify under the master's quota for the H-1B visa? So the answer to that question is no. The the, for the CAP, you have to have a U.S. master's degree from an accredited school or a university. So if you have a foreign master's, that will qualify you under the bachelor's quota and not the U.S. master's. The U.S. master's has a 20,000 limit, which is specifically created for U.S. master's degrees, which, are, which beneficiaries have attained from accredited university here in the U.S. Thank you, Deepika. This next question is for Kevin. Kevin, does the COVID-19 pandemic impact the naturalization interview process? Does it change it? Um, so for people who uh, have naturalization interviews scheduled during the pandemic, uh, I would say just be prepared for uh, any changes at the USCIS field office. They'll likely have instituted uh, strict COVID-19 mitigating policies to follow. Um, sp some specifics may include bringing your own black or blue pen to the interview for the naturalization test, um, because as I said, the English portion does have the writing uh, component. Um, another specific uh, 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 changes to the um, to 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 the policies could be uh, not arriving too early to the interview um, to prevent people from gathering in the uh, facility waiting areas. So stuff like that. And if you do have an attorney to accompany you, the attorney may will likely be seated in a separate room um, and but a screen will be set up so the attorney can know what's going on in the interview. So that's 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 something to watch out for. Um, but uh, all in all, just pay attention and, and carefully review the appointment notices and and see if there's any updates on this matter. Thank you, Kevin. This next question is for Kirti. What if the H-1B lottery picked a beneficiary who loses their job at the filing time? Is there any impact for the employer? Okay, so I think this question is specifically addressing those individuals that were, say, on STEM OPT or some other, uh, or OPT or CPT, some other form of employment or training where they were, where they had joined an employer and while um, the person that was selected for the lottery that uh, and then the employer due to many reasons such as COVID-19 uh, economic slowdown decided look we're not going to proceed with the H-1B filing itself even though we had filed for the lottery selection due to the circumstances change we can no longer um, we can no longer proceed with it there's nothing that needs to be done if you don't file the um the H-1B petition related to the lottery selection, then the they will use that lottery number and give it to some other applicant. And the employer does not need to respond or inform anybody. Uh, there was a specific guidance on um, on AILA, the American Lawyers, American Immigration Lawyers Association that if you do not plan on using a registration, you simply do not have to submit anything. There's no way of connecting the two because the petition hasn't been filed. So it does not impact the employer and it um, there's nothing uh, further that needs to be done if they decide not to proceed with the uh, actual filing. Great. Thank you, Kirti. This next question is also for you. Is it safe to travel on advanced parole? Um Advanced parole, uh, if you're a DACA recipient, um, uh, I'm assuming that's what you were implying to, uh, Sasha. Um, it, it's always uh, safe to travel on um, advanced parole as long as it's valid when you leave. And I think specific to DACA recipients, there's a little concern about, hey, is it okay to travel, not okay to travel? Um, because a lot of a lot of uh, DACA um DACA requirements revolve around being present in the United States and not. So 
Uh, yes, as long as you have the advanced parole in hand, you leave after you've received it and then you enter before it expires, you should be fine. Thank you, Kirti. This next question says um, that this person was selected in the H-1B lottery last year, but due to Trump's proclamation, they received their H-1B approval too late compared with previous years. Now I have received the I-797B, but have not been interviewed. This person is wondering, will the policy change now, especially when the consulates open back up for work visa interviews? Are there any changes related to this um, from Biden so far? For whoever is comfortable answering this one. I can take that, Sasha. Um, so if once the proclamation ends and they start interviewing people on H-1B, they can just go ahead and make the appointment like they would otherwise um, have done it before the proclamation and go ahead and apply for the H-1B and pursued and in taking taking over the position that was offered to them. Um, are there any specific changes on what what happens to uh, the evaluation and the processing of it? No. If the um, that's assuming the proclamation uh, is set to expire and then the the processing of those uh, H and Ls resume. Thank you for that, Kirthi. Um This next question is wondering. When will we be able to process new blanket L1 cases via consulate? So, Sasha, I'll take that. Um, we've done a few L1 blanket cases where, uh, you know, the person was able to get a visa interview successfully done. However, when you're going and applying for a visa, you need to show that you are exempt from the proclamation, meaning that you are of national um, exempt. You know, you are you're really required here on emergency basis and you know, there is there is economic hardship to the employer if you're not able to come to the U.S. So if you're able to provide that justification to the U.S. consulates, then visas are successfully being obtained from the U.S. consulates. So uh, appointments are open and uh, U.S. consulates are giving dates for appointments so the employer can check back with U.S. consulates. Great. Thank you, Deepika. This next question is wondering, are parents eligible for legal status if their children are U.S. citizens under this these new proposed policies? I can take that one, Sasha. I, I think what the um, individual is referring to is, are, are there any other new um, forms of status available to uh, parents of U.S. citizens? Um, through new policies, and not that I'm aware of anything new, you would still have to have a, a, a 20, um, a, a, a U.S. citizen of age to be able to file and petition for their parents, and they would have to go through the I-130 process just like everybody else at this point. Okay, thank you, Kirti. Um, we are still taking questions. We have some time left. If you haven't submitted your questions yet, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A chat box and we will keep addressing these questions while we still have time. This next question is wondering, is it possible to obtain a TN visa for Canadian citizens right now? Is there any restriction due to COVID-19? Sasha, again, uh, to answer that question, it all depends upon the US consulates in Canada and Mexico. Um, actually not Canada, Mexico mainly. Uh, if there is there are appointments, we have had some cases which have been successfully stamped for the TN visas uh, in Mexico, and uh, people have been able to obtain TN visas. For Canadians, it's more um, border stamping, so we really don't know if the borders have opened up. If they have, then they are able to come in. Otherwise, there is still a ban for uh, the borders and the TN visa stampings at the border. Thank you, Deepika. This next question is for Kirti. How long does it take to get your DACA application processed? Um, you know, I, I think it, it all depends on what service center uh, that you would file it with. But um, it, the, the range is pretty broad, anywhere from three to nine months. So just depends on where your application is going and the, the level of review of your application. Uh, and the ease of getting your background checked and stuff for them. Uh, it, it just depends. It's anywhere from three to nine months at this point. Wonderful. Thank you, Kirti. 
So it looks like that may be the end of the questions that we have received. If you didn't get the chance to ask your question today, please feel free to send us an email at info at chug.com, or you can email one of our presenters with the contact information that we have on the screen. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to schedule a consultation, please email one of our presenters that you see listed here. Please feel free to visit our website at chug.com, that's C-H-U-G-H, to view um, upcoming webinars and register for them. And we also recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel, Chug LLP, to make sure that you stay up to date with great new business content each week. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, and we wish you a safe and happy week ahead.